Good evening. I'm Nadim Kafarani, European Clinical and Business Manager for Ultrasound. I'm very pleased to welcome you on this fourth MSK Ultrasound webinar organized by Canon Medical Systems. Let me start with one important point regarding questions and answers. Please use QA function of Zoom platform for asking questions. They will be discussed at the end of the two lectures. This webinar will introduce how lastest technologies in high frequency ultrasound can influence MSK diagnosis in challenging examinations. For that, I feel really honored to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Jan de Reiser from Swiss, the Netherlands, and Professor Dr. Carsten Knobloch from Hanover in Germany. Our first speaker today is Dr. Jan de Reiser. He is creator of Open MRI dedicated musculoskeletal radiology center in the Netherlands. Active ESSR member, part of Subcommittee of General of Imaging Guided Intervention. He has a strong experience on musculoskeletal radiology and international sonography, especially in guided nerves intervention field. He is organizing workshops and giving lectures on international congresses, like ECR or ESSR, to improve the quality of ultrasound diagnosis and guiding treatments. And today, he will talk to you about one very challenging examination, the ultrasound of hip and pelvis area. Dr. Verizer, I give you the voice. So I am Jan Verrezer, I am a musculoskeletal radiologist and I am working in the Netherlands in Sluis. And uh, we work at Canon, we have a Canon 3 Tesla Gallon MRI, we have two MRI systems. This is the most important for the musculoskeletal imaging. It's a very good machine for um, uh, musculoskeletal imaging. It has very special uh, flex coils which give very nice images. I am also performing a lot of ultrasound also on Canon on the Aplio. Uh, 800 series, which is also very nice for uh, musculoskeletal imaging. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, ultrasound imaging of the hip. So for the hip, hip is a very difficult examination and uh, we have uh, uh, the opportunity to use the linear 14 megahertz probe from Canon, which is very, very dedicated and very good for the hip examination. And it's almost the only probe I use to uh, examine the hip because it's going very deep and it gives very good detail. And I'm gonna try to show this. I always work or I try to standardize the uh, ultrasound examination in this way that I try to make reference images. So this means a standard examination. I always perform almost the same examination uh, with all the visible structures and in a way that is recognizable so that you can see uh, what tendon we are looking at. That's what I try to do. So the hip, we start with the hip joint. The hip joint has a capsule and has reinforcements of the capsule, three main ligaments, and uh, especially the anterior one, the iliofemoral ligament, we can see very well on ultrasound. And it's a very thick ligament. It's in fact the thickest ligament of the body and uh, very strong to keep uh, the hip joint in its place. So we look at the hip from the anterior side and we see here the capsule. This is the capsule. We can see a little bit of the labrums uh, uh, lying under the capsule, but it's not really reliable on ultrasound. But we can see a part of the anterior part of the labrum until the lateral part. The only thing which is reliable, that's the same with the menisci in the knee, is the cysts. When we see a cyst from the labrum, then we are pretty sure there's a labral tear. So the capsule, and here we see the reinforcement of the capsule, which is the iliofemoral ligament, very thick ligament. It's originating above the uh, labrum and it's inserting on the femur neck. So we see the iliofemoral ligament on this drawing and we see there's an anterior part and also a posterior part in the capsule. So there's a fold uh, coming back along the femoral neck here. And there's a posterior part of the capsule. In this hip joint of a child, we can see that there is fluids. And here we can depict very well the iliofemoral ligaments and the anterior capsule. And then the fold, which is coming back, the posterior part of the capsule, which is inserting very close to the cartilage here. This can be three millimeter and this three millimeter. So six millimeter is normal. We are still looking at the anterior part of the hip. 
this is the first position we use. So we start with the patient's uh, supine, just a normal position, and we look at the anterior part of the hip and the hip tendons. Here we see the iliofemoral ligament, and this is very uh, nice, and uh, we see it very much, almost always. The iliofemoral ligament is merging with the direct head of the rectus femoris in many, many cases. So we can see this here. This is the thick iliofemoral ligament, and this is the direct head of the rectus femoris. This is the first tendon we uh, look at in our standard examination. Here we see it, the direct head of the rectus femoris. The rectus femoris has two heads. So this is the first head, the direct head of the rectus femoris, which is straight and is originating on the inferior spinal uh, spina. Uh, the spina of uh, the anterior inferior spina. Um, this is the same image. So we always look at our tendons and our structures, mostly in the longitudinal plane and in the actual plane, in the short axis and the long axis. So you can see here we look in the long axis, then we turn the probe and we look in the right short axis of the direct head, direct head of the rectus femoris. Then we see the spina, the spina. And here we see the direct head originating on the spina. And then we go more distally and we see the direct head very nicely like this. And in tendons, we always try to get them nicely uh, white, I call this. So nice using the isotropy of the tendons to see if they are pathologic or not. When you can get the tendon white and black. So when there is normal anisotropy in the tendons, then we can say that the tendon is normal. There's no tendinosis. When we go more distally, we see this structure appearing here in the direct head. This is not tendinosis or something. This is the indirect head and the indirect head has a different course. It's coursing laterally to the acetabulum where it's originating. And because of this other course, we have anisotropy. So it has another tropy and uh, it's getting black. And we can also, also see it very nicely here. The tendon is turning to the lateral side of the acetabulum. And we see also here the direct head and we see this tendon is coursing in a different direction. So it's getting black. How we solve this, we have to turn the probe. We always have to try to look at the tendons the right way. So the right longitudinal uh, axis and therefore we have to put the probe parallel to the tendon. So we have to turn the tendon here, uh, to turn the probe parallel to the tendon, more like this and more, more and more, because this tendon is going very laterally. So we do this and then we have this image here and we turn more, more and more here and then we see the tendon nicely appearing. So this is the indirect head of the rectus femoris. I always look at it because there's also pathology of this tendon. Okay, the next tendon on the anterior side of the hip is the iliopsoas tendon. For this, we take our second position of the examination. So we bend the knee 30 degrees and we do exorotation of the hip. In this position, we see very well the iliopsoas tendon. We see this tendon, so the psoas and the iliacus tendon, two tendons in the most of the cases, and they pass here in front of the joint at three o'clock, which we can see here. Here in front of the joint, we see in this case one tendon passing uh, the joint. We look more distally here. We look for the lesser tubercle of the, of the femur, and we have to look at it in this position, otherwise we cannot see it. So. We look the longitudinal plane of the tendon and we see it inserting here on the lesser tubercle. Very nice tendon and you almost only can see it in this position. Here we see it again, two tendons in this case and here also two tendons until the insertion. We also look at it, as I told you, in the axial short axis plane. So we put the probe like this here, and then we see the muscle belly of the iliopsoas and the two tendons. 
in the same position, so with the bended knee and the hip in exorotation, we go medially to the origin of the adductor tendons. A very difficult structure also. Um, the common adductor tendon has three tendons merging together. The adductor magnus, the adductor brevis, which is more proximal and uh, superficial, and the most superficial and proximal one, the longus, which is uh, giving most part of the tendon, the common tendon. So we have to, I don't know if this isn't, yes, okay, it's good. So um, the common adductor tendon looks like this here, looks like this. So before, when we didn't have such nice uh, probes and uh, ultrasound machines, it was very difficult to evaluate um, these tendons. This is general in the hip. And uh, mostly when we looked at it on ultrasound, it was always black. So what we had to tell about it. But now with the new probes, uh, we can see the isotropy or anisotropy in the tendons. And we can, as I told you, try to make them white and black. So we have to get signal or uh, reflections in the tendon. So this is the common adductor tendon. And we see it as a nice as isotropy. So it's normal. Now we can depict it very well. And here we see the three muscle bellies, the longus, the brevis, and the magnus coming together in this common tendon. So we best look at it in this position. Remember that three positions for the hip. We start with this late leg straight, then we turn the knee outside and the flex the hip. And the last position will be in a lateral decubitus. We can also see here the pubic bone is very difficult. We have ligaments there. And we also have something like uh, the common adductor origin and the rectus abdominis. That's one complex. It's very difficult, but we can depict it very well. So we look more at the pubic bone, then we see the ligaments of the pubic bone uh, crossing the pubic joint. And also we can see the conjoint tendon with the rectus abdominis. So these structures we can depict very well with these techniques and these probes. We can also look at the pectineus. We can also look at the femoral nerve, which I didn't include it here now today because of uh, time limits. One important nerve is the uh, nervus cutaneus femoris lateralis, which is um, a sensible nerve which is passing under the inguinal ligaments on the lateral side. The course is a little bit uh, uh, variable, so it can come over the superior iliac spine or it can come under the ligaments. And it can give it, in case, in case of compression, you can have meralgia parasitica, which is uh, uh, a very rather painful sensation on the lateral side of the uh, upper leg. Here we see this nerve here passing under the inguinal ligaments. And we can turn the probe in the longitudinal plane over this nerve so that so we can depict the nerve in the longitudinal plane. The trick to find this nerve, it's not always as easy. Is I do it like this. I follow the sartorius. Sartorius is running obliquely to the medial side of the, of the knee. And we follow it and then the nerve is crossing a little bit in an oblique way, this uh, tendon or muscle. And then we see this nerve appearing, especially when it's pathologic and when the nerve is swollen, hypoechogenic and painful. The next position, so we go to the lateral hip, very important, very difficult, especially before, but now we can see it very well. And uh, it's a very common pathology, so um, the trochanteric pain syndrome, like we all know, and it's very difficult to evaluate, but I show you how you can see very well these tendons, three tendons on the uh, greater trochanter, and uh, how we have to image it, and how we make the standard images and recognizable images of these three tendons. We have three facets on the lateral, uh, on the uh, greater uh, trochanter. So we have the anterior facet, we have the uh, uh, 
lateral facet and the postural superior facets. These three facets have muscle insertions. Postero, postero superior facet. Then we have another facet, postero inferior facet. There is no tendon on the postero inferior facet. This is the facet where the gluteus maximus is passing by. It's a naked facet. Very important is the start. So we start first of all with a good position. So the patient must be straight and lateral decubitus straight. Uh, and uh, uh, in this position, so the subcutaneous fat of the trochanter and the uh, gluteal uh, regions are uh, the, um, the smallest. So we can look at the best way, even in patients which have a little bit more weight and fat, we can uh, depict very well the trochanter. Then we look very important for the uh, trochanter axial reference image. And what we look for? We look for this anterior facet, lateral and postural superior facet. And the trick is here, this is a, a bended mountain-like uh, anterior facet. It's only a few millimeters we can depict this, but this is what you have to look for. And one uh, tip, one trick is that most people look too much in the back. So try more in the front. You look like this. There you're going to find it. This is a reference image. This is an old image, but I like to show it. This was from an Aplio 500. So you see the different resolution with the Aplio 800. But um, this is my reference image. This you have to look for, this. It's only a few millimeters uh, craniocaudally, but you look for this. And this is the lateral facet, and this is the posterior facet with superior and inferior parts. So this is the reference image. When you have this image, then we're going to turn the probes in the longitudinal plane of the tendons. First, we start in the front with the gluteus minimus, muscle and tendon. It looks like this, and it's inserting on the anterior facet of the trochanter. To look at the trochanter, I'm going to tell you some tricks. We start here, we look to the back. We start in the front, we look to the back. The probe must be cranially turned uh, to the front. When we go look at the other tendons, we have to move a little bit up. So this side, we look anteriorly, we look to the posterior side and we go up cranially here and then here. Here we look straight, and here we look to the anterior side. So this movement, a fan-like movement, uh, is very well to visualize these three tendons. First reference image is the minimus, how the minimus looks like. Like this, it's recognizable. This is the anterior facet. This is the gluteus minimus tendon. Here is passing the iliotibial band here above it, and one trick also is here we see a muscle belly. This is the gluteus medius muscle belly. So the medius is over covering the minimus. And I tell you that normal, uh, a normal gluteus minimus tendon is four millimeter. We measure it here, it's four millimeter. You can check that. A normal tendon will be four millimeter. When there is fluid in the bursa, it will be first of all here, and secondly, here. We can look more proximally to the muscle belly of the minimus. Here is the muscle belly of the minimus, laying next to the iliac crest here, muscle belly of the minimus. This is the medius. The medius is over covering the minimus, as you can see. So we go to the gluteus medius, the second tendon of the greater trochanter. And as I told you, it's over covering the minimus. Here is the minimus. The medius is over covering the minimus. There are two tendons of the medius, one for the lateral facet and one for the posterior superior facet. How the medius looks like. We look at it like this. So as I told you, we look straight and a little bit more cranially than the first position. So we started here with the minimus, go a little up and straight now. And this is how the minimus on the lateral facet looks like, like this. Here we see the iliotibial band passing. There's no more muscle here. 
and this tendon is three millimeter. You can check it. It's three millimeter in normal conditions. Also, when there's a fluid in this bursa, there are three bursas. In the medius bursa, you're gonna see it here, first of all, here and there, surrounding the tendon. Then we have our third tendon and we look at it like this. So we went from here more cranially to there, fan-like, and now we turn a little bit to the back and we look to the anterior part. So this tendon is going straight up straight up like this, and it looks like this. A little bit thicker here, rather thick always here on the posterior superior facet, which has typically this appearance, round, and this is typical appearance of this second tendon of the gluteus medius. This is the tendon of the gluteus medius on the posterior superior facet. This is recognizable. So, to have an overview now, the minimus, more caudally, we go cranially and more cranially. We turn the probe first anteriorly and we look to the back. We look straight for the second tendon and then we turn more the probe and we look to the anterior uh, side. This is the images we have to make, the minimus, the medius lateral facet and the medius posterior superior facet. Reference images are recognizable. In the actual plane, as I told you, we have to look in the short axis and in the long axis. The actual plane, we start with the anterior facet. As I told you, it's a little bit lower. So first image here is this one. This is the anterior facet, the mountain, uh, the bended uh, facet. And here we see a tendon that's the minimus. Then we go a little bit up cranially. Then on the lateral facet, we see appearing the medius, the medius. And when we go more cranially, we see on the posterior superior facet appearing the second part of the medius. As I told you, there are three bursa surrounding, first of all, the minimus, then the medius, and then we have a big bursa, which can be present under the maximus. So that's on the posterior inferior facet of the greater trochanter on the naked facet. And that's where the maximus is passing and where you can have, in case of friction, a bursa. That's a greater trochanteric bursa. We have also to look at the origin of the gluteus medius on the iliac crest. Here we have also a tendon. And I see sometimes tendinopathy here. And then the patient complains of pain here and can also have pain in the abdominal wall because this tendon is merging with the abdominal uh, muscle insertions. This is also a recognizable image. This tendon looks like this. Then the maximus, that's a little bit difficult, so a big, big muscle belly. The insertion is very special. The insertion is first of all on the femur. On MRI scan, it looks like this. This is the insertion of the maximus. It's inserting on the femur, on the linea aspera. There's a tuberosity for it here, but it has a kind of uh, facial uh, insertion on the fascia lata and the uh, vastus lateralis here. And we can see it also on ultrasound. This is the insertion here, like you see here on the fascia and the fascia lata, also a little bit uh, fascis lateralis of the quadriceps. Here you see this fascia. So you see this muscle inserting there. This is the insertion, part of the insertion of the gluteus maximus. And this is the insertion on the tuberosity of the femur, which is mostly a little bit irregular there when under the insertion. That's normal. I look at it because I also see pathology there. Then we go to the posterior part of, um, of the hip and the pelvis. As I told you a little bit already of the maximus. When we take away the maximus, uh, then we see the exorotators of the hip. Or we can see the exorotators of the hip. 
these are rather difficult muscles and uh, I think we can see it rather well with the probe I told you about, the 14 megahertz per probe. And uh, you can evaluate it. So first of all, we have the piriformis. Everybody knows the piriformis. We have a syndrome, piriformis syndrome, which is very difficult. Um, but we can see the piriformis uh, on ultrasound. More caudally, we see the obturatorius internus and the gemelli, two small muscles, and a rather important muscle, the quadratus femoris. The ischial nerve uh, runs uh, above the exorotatus and then goes, dives under the sartorius muscle and the gluteus maximus. And that can be a, a location of problems and of the piriformis syndrome. How these muscles look like? So, as I told you, I keep the patient in the lateral decubital position like this, and then we go behind the greater trochanter and we look at the tuber, and in between we have these muscles and this ischiofemoral space, we call it. This is typical appearance of the quadratus femoris muscle here, very nice muscle, big muscle. And when we go more cranially, we can see, so the quadratus femoris is here. Here is the hamstrings, so the tuber. And more cranially, we see these exorotators, obturatorius internus gemelli, and the piriformis, which is inserting on the most cranial part of the greater trochanter. Here we see the obturatorius internus joined with the gemelli here, and this is the piriformis here. I don't show you much pathology, uh, but I want to show you something we can depict well on ultrasound, and uh, I regularly find this. So issue femoral impingement, which you can see on MRI. I show this MRI image to show you the lesser trochanter and the tuber, and this is the space uh, which is concerning this impingement when it is too narrow. These are the values. So we have a space, a bony space between the lesser tubercle and the tuber, and we have a, a soft tissue space between the tendons of the hamstrings and the lesser tubercle. This must be around two centimeter and a little bit more than one centimeter. So you need at least one a little bit more than one centimeter in the space. And this is the quadratus femoris passing in this space. This was a very nice case of uh, impingement. As you can see, this space is much too narrow. This is on MRI, the hamstrings. This is the lesser tubercle. Here is passing the quadratus femoris muscle with the formation of a neobursa, which is caused by impingement. As you can see, this space also on the other side is uh, very, very narrow. So this is a very painful condition. And we can see it on ultrasound. Yes, this is, a, this, is this bursa, which you see here, and this space is too narrow. And we especially can see it on dynamic imaging. Like we see this space closing here and this bursa is coming out. This is also very painful. This is the hamstrings muscles and this is the soft tissue space. This was in a normal patient, the same. This is the hamstring tendons. And here we see the quadratus femoris muscle passing through it. So this we can also see on the posterior side. Then the ischiatical nerve itself, you can see also very well, especially with this probe. This probe is really good to in this depth so we see, this is a composed image. So we see the ischial nerve coming here, running over the exorotators I just told you about, and then going under the maximus muscle belly and the piriformis muscle belly and entering or exiting the pelvis here. Very nice image. So we can see very well the ischial nerve. I do it also, as I told you, in this position. Then the tuber and the hamstrings. So we have uh, two big tendons, semimembranosus, first of all, which is originating medial on the knee and inserting on the, or originating on the tuber on the lateral side and more anteriorly. 
and also more cranially. Then we have two conjoined tendons, the biceps and the semitendinosus, which form one conjoined tendon and which are more superficial when you look from the back, uh, where we look with a probe, uh, more superficial and a little bit more medially. Also, these tendons we can see very well on ultrasound. First of all, in the actual plane, again, in the same position, actual plane. So we see the tuber and we see more superficially one conjoined tendon, which is the biceps and the semitendinosus conjoined tendon. Here we see the ischial nerve and here the quadratus, lumbor, uh, quadratus femoris. We go more distally, here we can depict the ischial nerve. When you look in the longitudinal plane, we can see it very well in this position. This is the most superficial conjoined tendon biceps semitendinosus. And when we look deeper, we see two tendons, which they're a little bit coursing in another uh, plane and direction. But in this uh, image, we see them both. And then this is typical image of the semimembranosus, which is going more deep, more high, and more anterior on the tuber. I thank you, and uh, I hope I showed you some new things and some uh, nice reference images. I always perform my examinations this way, so I make always the same images. And I think we, as radiologists, should do that and uh, especially make recognizable images. Thank you, Dr. Verizer, for this very complete and very clear uh, presentation about this difficult area. Our second speaker for today is Professor Dr. Kartan Knobloch. Owner of a special practice, he is specialist in hand surgery, diagnosis and treatment of tendon problems, especially in the Achilles and patella tendons. He supports national and international top athletes, especially from football, tennis, and golf. He is a member of the editorial board of the British Journal of Sports Medicine, principal reviewer of the American Journal of Sports Medicine, and author of large numbers of publications focusing on the Achilles tendon problems. And today, his presentation is about ultra high frequency imaging of superficial extremities, tendons. Dr. Nolbo, I give you the voice. Thank you. So, dear Nadim, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct pleasure for me to be on that big stage uh, today for Canon. So my talk of today is on ultra high frequency ultrasound on much more superficial structures. So my interest in tendons started some 17 years ago when I was using a laser Doppler flowmetry system which was combined with oximetry. And I measured um, beneath others the Achilles tendon microcirculation. So we could determine by quantitative means by the laser Doppler, the vascularization of painful Achilles tendons. And in case of mid portion Achilles tendinopathy, we found that at the very location in the mid portion, as you see on the left hand side, um, the capillary blood flow was significantly elevated in contrast to the corresponding asymptomatic site in the same patients on the other hand, if it's a uh, ipsilateral uh, problem. And this was published at that time in the American Journal. And these elevated capillary blood flows nicely correlate qualitatively with the visualization of these neovessels uh, by power Doppler ultrasound, as you see, this is an image of me in the year 2013 in the Achilles tendon. You can see these neo vessels in patella tendinopathy in this professional soccer player. You see the enlargement in the AP diameter of the patella tendon and the neovascularization arising from the Hoffa fat pad. And we could show even for uh, uh, tendinopathies of the upper, upper extremity, say on the De Cauvin, on the first extensor compartment, that this neovascularization is uh, applicable and visualable uh, even on the upper extremity. And this was in 2008, you know. So in 2012, 
I started my private practice uh, with this given patient, uh, namely a, a soccer player who just ended his career last summer for an Achilles tendinopathy issue. And my personal ultrasound history started with Toshiba machines. In my practice, I started with the Nemio and I just received in November last uh, year the Aplio uh, 800. So say it with Shakespeare, what passed is prologue. So I will uh, tell you and show you some images and video clips on the Matrix, on the novel Matrix probes with 18 megahertz with 24 megahertz and some images and videos with a 33 megahertz matrix probe, as well as the novel M22 uh, matrix probe in a hockey stick fashion, which is especially useful in hand surgical indications. It is not uh, that long ago that in December 2020, when these two gentlemen from Austria did a webinar on ultrasound in carpal tunnel and non or minimal invasive uh, techniques. And I show you just to start with a, uh, an image um, where, where I performed mini open conventional carpal tunnel uh, operation or release. You can see here with the 18 matrix probe, the median nerve, you see here the ulnar artery and the space in between is called the Nakamoto space where it is quite safe in, if you do minimal invasive techniques to operate in this area. So in between median nerve and ulnar artery, Nakamoto space to disrupt the ligamentum carpi transversum. And this is a post-operative or post-surgical patient five days after surgical release with the 33 uh, uh, high frequency or ultra high frequency probe, medium nerve, disruption of the ligamentum carpi transversum. And you can even see still the incision site five days post-op here and my incision well within the Nakamoto space visualized by the ultra high frequency probe. This is a 69 year old Lebanese who was uh, afraid or concerned with the nail growth disruption smart line as you can see here. And I used the hockey stick matrix probe 22 Hertz on the DIP joint. So this is the IP joint, this is a nail plate and you see a, a dorsal exophyte protruding into the nail matrix which caused the nail uh, growth disruption. And this was verified by 3D uh, DVT CT scan with the, uh, with the Hebadine arthrosis osteoarthritis, as you see. Another very nice indication to use um, for dynamic ultrasound is trigger finger. So in trigger finger, an enlargement of the tendon is typically trapped within the annular ligaments. And this is a patient uh, which I saw just yesterday. So you see the superficial flexor digitorum tendon, you see the deep profundus flexor digitorum pom, uh, tendon, which is enlarged, and you see the triggering because I do passive motion on the given finger and you can see or appreciate how it snaps back and forth beneath the A1 uh, annular ligament. This is a FPL, so a thumb or so, um, uh, trigger finger. And you see a folding of the uh, distal part of the tendon because it has, does not go smoothly. Uh, through the annular ligament canal. This visualized with the conventional 18, uh, 17 megahertz hockey stick probe. And this is again the matrix 22 matrix probe, FPL tendon thump again. You see the enlargement of the tendon and how it sticks in the A1 uh, annular ligament. And this is a quadruple view on a patient uh, with the conventional hockey stick 17 megahertz. He was symptomatic for trigger fingers in the ring and in the small finger, as you see in the upper panels. And he was asymptomatic uh, on the index and on the middle finger in the lower part. So you can quite nicely visualize and usually oftentimes the profundus, so the deep flexor tendon is enlarged and is causing the trigger finger syndrome. So dynamic, high resolution, high frequency ultrasound of the hand. 
And there has been even recent some reports from Japan uh, suggesting that even the by use of power Doppler and others, you can appreciate the very same vascularization as I mentioned before on the patella and on the Achilles tendon. Another clinical entity are pulley ganglions and uh, using the already mentioned 22 hockey stick probe, you see here a patient with an annular uh, ganglion, which you can see here. In, in the long axis, superficial and deep flexor tendon, not harmed by the ganglioma. This is the same in the short axis, as you can see here with the hockey stick. And this is the same with the 33 megahertz ultra high frequency probe, as you can appreciate here. So this is very, very nice probe, especially for structures within or within uh, the first centimeter of tissue depth. If it comes to therapy in trigger finger, my current approach is starting non-invasively with uh, extracorporeal shock wave, combining radial and focused, then maybe based on uh, symptomatic ultrasound guided injections and potentially minimal invasive surgery. So you see here an image with the hockey stick 22 hertz of guided or ultrasound guided peritendinous trigger finger injection. So this is the injection just right in the peritendinous space. And I'm doing a hydro dissection, which you can see and appreciate just superficial of the superficial tendon. And you see the inflow of my uh, injection agent um, guided by the ultra hockey stick ultrasound. And of note, if you do this, there is some recent reports that it's much better to use if you use triamcinolone alone and not combining it with lidocaine or even lidocaine with uh, adrenaline like psilocytine because it's much more painful, just published. And if it comes to surgery, sometimes it is quite wise to have an interval in between your cortisone injection and your operation or your op open operation. Because recently in the journal uh, of hand surgery in the American edition, it was found that if you inject cortisone and operate within 90 days, nine or oh, days after your cortisone injection, you might end up with a slightly but statistically significant higher risk of infection. So do not do injections in the, in the face of an upcoming operation in that way. So a recent report or recent, uh, let's say image I want to share with you because patient was yesterday with me is the meniscus. And actually uh, when I started with the, uh, with the uh, Aplio 800 system in testing, my very first patient was this. And uh, I just put on the a 33 megahertz probe and you see the medial, uh, medial knee joint space. This is the medial collateral ligament and this is the uh, medial meniscus. And he was a week before an MRI because he suffered some clicking um, and a medial uh, meniscal tear. And this for the first time was a visualization by ultrasound with the high resolution 33 megahertz uh, probe and just by chance yesterday he was back again here and I managed him conservatively with shock waves and novel magnetolit therapy only and this is six months after now and um, I'm doing a dynamic assessment of his medial meniscus and you can see beforehand the, the rupture and now although he is 48 years old half a year later it healed and even in stress testing, you see a very nice consolidation of the medial meniscus without any clicking, without any symptoms. And he's able to run three times 10 kilometers in a week in the moment. So let me just briefly show you some advanced Doppler, Doppler modes. This is a radial uh, conventional ganglion with the 33 megahertz probe. And you see the arteria radialis overriding on this ganglion with power Doppler and the same patient with, um, um, with advanced dynamic flow Doppler metry. So you see the trampoline effect of the radial artery pushing on the radial uh, ganglion. 
if it comes to tennis elbow or lateral apicondylitis, you see here a quadruple view with left upper panel power Doppler, right advanced dynamic flow, and in the lower panels, the superb microvascular imaging in color and in monochrome. So somehow um, a in vitro uh, visualization of the vascularization in a cardiac surgeon on his right elbow who has suffered uh, significant pain. And you now, with the help of the vascular index, can even determine by numbers the degree of vascularization here determined by SMI. This is the extensor or common extensor origin uh, of the lateral elbow. You see here the marked uh, inflammation and you can uh, assess it by numbers. And this helps quite a lot, not only in the assessment, but even in serial testing, if you uh, do any kind of uh, therapeutic approach, uh, you might monitor this by the um, quantitative measurement of the vascular index. And the same holds true for the 24 megahertz probe. You see here another patient with tennis elbow, again with power Doppler, SMI, SMI monochrome and ADF. And, but with 24 hertz, so a higher resolution. And you can even appreciate a much nicer uh, visualization and differentiation of the tiny vessels in his common extensor origin. So coming shortly to the groin, this was a professional soccer player who just went to me three uh, days ago for inguinal pain on the left hand side and this is his inguinal uh, um, uh, region with two lymph nodes over his uh, vascular vessels and um, Ajen did uh, SMI on these lymph nodes which were quite superficial as you see and you see a marked vascularization of the of this lymph node very superficial just five six millimeter uh, from above and there is in the Canon uh, journal a nice article on the normal and the abnormal vascularization of lymph nodes. And a normal or reactive, not malignant lymph node usually has a central, uh, let's say, perfusion or supply of the vessels. And this holds true as you see in this given patient. Uh, as well, this is with the monochrome SMI and he is up to evaluation now for the reason for this uh, reactive lymphadenopathy. So coming shortly to the Achilles tendon, the same fashion, quadruple view, grayscale ultrasound conventional. This is insertional Achilles tendinopathy with a large tendinosus calcarea with a huge heartland deformity. You see on the right upper panel, the power Doppler and the vascularization in the Achilles tendon is coming from the Carga fat pad. So anterior of the tendon, and then it differentiates and branches within the Achilles tendon. You see upper left, uh, down, uh, lower left panel, SMI and ADF on the right lower, lower panel. And the same holds true now for the uh, left hand side long axis, right hand side and lower panels on the short axis of the Achilles tendon. You know, so you see that the vascularization is coming from anterior, from the carga fat pad, and then differentiates within the uh, Achilles, symptomatic Achilles tendon, as you see here. And again, as I mentioned before, you can use SMI with vascular index for, vasc for quantitative measurement and assessment of the degree of vascularization. This holds true for patellar tendinopathy as well. You see here a patella tendinopathy patient, anterior knee pain. You see the arising of the neurovascularization from the Hofer fat pad. This is with the 18 megahertz probe. And the same holds true, you know it already with the quadruple view. So you can all assess your uh, vascularization and get an idea of how the um, micro architecture of the vascularization is. And if you compare uh, the 18 and the 24 megahertz for given indication. This is patella tendinopathy, same patient, same vessels, left hand side 18 megahertz, right hand side 24 megahertz. So uh, the Chinese saying uh, an image is more, uh, worth uh, 1000 words. 
you see most likely uh, some differences in resolution. The same holds true now for SMI. So right-hand side, again, 24 megahertz, left-hand side, 18 megahertz, same patient. So you get an idea of how the vascularization is, where the feeding vessel is, and how the microarchitecture is. And the same holds true now for the Achilles tendon, again, left-hand side 18, le uh, right-hand side 24 megahertz. And you even can do some SMI-guided interventions. This is a, a Haglund exostosis, insertional Achilles tendinopathy with a marked inflammation, which you can see here arising from the Kaga fat pad on the lower level. And I'm injecting from medial side uh, polydocanol sclerosing under SMI control. You see now I'm in the Kaga fat pad just beneath anterior of the vessels and every, uh, let's say every 0 0.2, 0.1 milliliter uh, of polydocanol, because it's so sensitive, uh, um, blush up or blur up, the, the image or flash up the signals. But after a while, you see now the vascularization within the tendon, although not touching the tendon at all, is decreasing quite significantly. So all of a sudden, five, six seconds, if you have SMI guided ultrasound extra tendinous injection, you can achieve these kind of results. So coming to the end, just some words on elastography you might have heard of. There are two, let's say, main differences, physically by strain and shear wave elastography. And to have quantitative measures, you have to have shear wave uh, elastography. The Apleo system can be bought with a shear wave elastography system, which usually is uh, applied in liver diagnosis or in uh, mama uh, diagnosis on malignancy. And you can use it even, and I tried it on tendons and muscles. And you see here, there are MODI like measure area detection where in each of these squares, a measurement is taken. Um, it is by numbers, as you see here, 26 kilopascal. And this is the standard deviation. And this is the SMI image correlating to this, to this image. You see here a left symptomatic patient Achilles tendinopathy enlarged AP diameter. And this is a corresponding uh, shear wave elastography. So left-hand side, you see it in strain and by numbers, a significant reduced elasticity with higher values, higher values in this elasticity meaning stiffer tendon. So the higher your values, the stiffer the tendon or the measurement. And you can even monitor, and that's what I just started um, to use, um, your therapy, therapy on in terms of the elasticity. So this is a patient before and after focused or combined shockwave therapy. So you see immediately a significant decrease from 26 to 10 kilopascal elasticity. So elastic, elasticity became much better and the same holds true for the mentioned magnetolit electro um, magnetotransduction therapy. And this is plantar fasciitis in a female runner and the same holds true, um, a significant decrement and improvement of elasticity. And this is the last patient I show you, just saw him today with a trigger point in his day to eat muscle here, just on the knee of his uh, tattooed eagle. And uh, he received EMTT and uh, shockwave treatment and a measured elastography before and after. And you see before at the trigger point, he had some 30 kilopascal. And immediately after the combined treatment of shockwaves and EMTT, only 14. So a significant decrement of some more than 50% within only one session. And you see this was done today, and this is only 25 minutes in between. So I conclude that tendon ultrasound with the Aplio 800 allows to depict a number of tendon features. You can see a P diameter quite good, as you know. You can uh, assess the degree of vascularization with vascular index. You have different modi, Doppler, ad advanced dynamic flow, superb muscular imaging, and you can measure elasticity in kilopascal or meter per second. The 18 uh, megahertz probe is offering all Doppler modes and shear wave elastography. 
the 24 megahertz probe is even better in superb uh, tendon resolution, I would say, and even in the Doppler modes. However, as of now, unfortunately, and this is my wish for the future, maybe can and might implement shear wave elasto in the 24 megahertz probe. And the 33 megahertz probe is quite good for all really superficial uh, structures like within one centimeter, some superficial tendons, some superficial nerves, but again offers no elasto. And as you saw a number of images with the hockey stick matrix probe, it's well suited for hand ultrasound. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Knobloch. Very, very nice and impressive presentation, I need to say. Uh, Thank you both. Uh, so I have collected some questions from the audience during the, your lectures, and uh, I will try. So Dr. Verizer has already answered to some of them, but we can, yes. <laughs> I, th I think we can repeat that because I think they are interesting yes. for everyone. <laughs> so uh, the first question was uh, when examining, examining uh, hamstrings, why don't you do in a prone position? Um, well, I answered already because in a, in a prone position, you have more um, inconvenience of the gluteal uh, uh, muscle and fats, and you have the fault. So there's a problem of air and you have to, uh, I, in my experience, it's much more easy when you do it from the lateral, the cubital position, then you can push the fats and the fault aside, you know, like this. So here is the gluteal uh, muscle and then you go like this and then you push it kind of aside and you don't have the fault when people are laying on their belly so the gluteal muscles they are um, going down and you get the fault that's why okay thank you uh, second question you have your already answer to this one so how much time takes an examination of the hip uh, routine one normal one uh, in the beginning that I did it was half an hour. Now I do it in five to 10 minutes, but I always perform the complete examination. So we get the routine in it. And uh, I do this with every joint in fact. And um, uh, also you start to see it much more faster. So I need 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. And the last one regarding your Presentation. So, is there a way of doing diagnosis of peritrochanterian tendinopathy with normal ultrasound? The um, clinic, the MRI, so or normal? I think that they mean uh, with a uh, not canon ultrasound. <laughs> um, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I, I'm not going to talk about the other companies or other probes. I just work with this probe and um, I can see it very well. It, I think it's the best probe. So, I worked with uh, other companies. I don't going to mention names or something, but. Uh, it can be difficult. Yes, it uh, requires um, good technology. And in my opinion, this 14 megahertz probe is perfect for the pelvis and the hip and the tendons, but it can be a problem. And as I told uh, also in the presentation before we had uh, not such good, such, uh, good uh, probes and uh, it was always dark there on the trochanter and it was always bursitis. So that's not correct. We must see and visualize the tendons and um, also, bursitis is very rare. Bursitis is mostly secondary and uh, is, a, is in fact a tendinopathy with a reactive fluid in the bursa. The bursa is not inflammated, so it's a tendinopathy. So you must evaluate the tendons, the tendinosis, the tears, calcifications, erosions, everything. And it needs, of course, yes, uh, good technology. That's, yeah. It's difficult. And MRI is not so good because ultrasound has a much, much higher resolution than MRI. When you ask this question to many people, they say, everybody say almost it's MRI, but that's not true. MRI has uh, slices of three millimeter, two millimeter. So I showed you the tendons are four and three millimeters thick. So an MRI is very difficult. You don't see uh, detail. Okay. I think that's sufficient or? Uh, I think so. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry, I, I'll, click. I'll click on the on wrong. So thank you, Dr. Verizer. Uh, for Dr. Knobloch, uh, I have a question regarding the SMI, the value of, uh, 
where do you see the value of SMI for tendinopathy on initial diagnosis? Uh, especially compared to power Doppler with the potential risk of, uh, of uh, overestimation. Fully, fully agree. So I started sclerosing therapy and using power Doppler some 15 years ago. So power Doppler assessment is quite, in tendons is quite, I would say examiner dependent. So there is a lot of, you know, fine tuning on how. And usually there are quite good papers showing that power Doppler is, a, is of predictive value, for example, in Achilles tendinopathy to foresee whether or not this patient will develop problems. And SMI is even more sensitive. So I am usually starting still in a given patient with power Doppler. And if there is something in power Doppler, I then proceed to SMI to get a not even better idea of how the microarchitecture is, not only if there is something, but how it is, because as you saw, I do guided therapy. And the more I know on the vessel course, the better I can hit the vessel, you know? However, you know, as I did 16, 17 years on power Doppler, in my mind, I already calculate and I can now even see what I in the power Doppler see as one vessel, sometimes as two, three vessels in the SMI. So I would recommend always start and diagnose with power Doppler. And then if, pos if positive, then proceed to SMI. That's how Thank I you. do it in the moment. I think it's very wise. <laughs> uh, another qu or many questions about the, the shear wave and the elasticity. Uh, are you using elastography, uh, both techniques, uh, routinely, or uh, yes. is it something you, you reserve for certain specific uh, cases? I can tell you, Nadim, uh, as a, let's say, I tested the SMI on the old Toshiba machine in 2017 or 16, I think. And I said, okay, I wait for shear wave. And as soon as shear wave elastography is working, I buy a machine. And this was a time when shear wave and SMI were in the Canon machine, why I decided. So I decided pro Canon because of shear wave. So yes, I'm doing it in every patient. Yes, I'm doing it before and after every treatment. And yes, I'm doing it on both tendons. So I learn now how elasticity and how measurements and whatever in different layers have an impact on elasticity. So, and the jury is still open, you know, but I'm now in the observing phase, I would say, not in yeah. the conclusion, but in the observing and learning phase. Yeah, because it, it seems the, the, the values in shear wave are, can be very different according to the area, to the tendons, and some pathologies can increase the stiffness and some of the pathologies can, can decrease. What is your experience about, uh, about this phenomenon? Absolutely agree. So one issue is that the deeper you are, so measurement, usually the uh, canon says one centimeter or deeper, the upper, upper level of your window of assessment is working quite good. I assessed sometimes even uh, the upper limit as five or four millimeters with a big kind of gel with a constant probe pressure. And, but the more superficial you are, the harder it is to obtain very nice shear wave elastography. One, two, three centimeters deep, it is easy. But the more superficial, the harder it is. And, um, and you know, it, the, the automatic mode implemented with the um, mean and the standard deviation gives you an idea if your standard deviation is only 10%, then you can assess a very, with good solid confidence that these values are quite good. And in liver and in breast, it is said that you have to have three to five measurement areas to mm. obtain a value, not only a single location. So mm. these are all operators and examiner things to, to have some good values, I, I believe. Okay, thank you. And you are, we have to average the, the measurements. All right. Yeah. Uh, and the last question is related to uh, more to interventions. Uh, do you perform high volume injections and ultrasound control for Achilles tendin uh, tendinopathies? 
I don't need. Uh, so actually I'm doing two types in the Achilles tendon. I do either polydocanol injection, which is two millimeter, or I do hy hyaluronic acid injection. Same, same idea, two, millime two, two milliliters again. I'm aware and I'm a, I'm a friend of Nicola Mafuli who's advocating high volume uh, you know, injections with some 20 or even more milliliters volume. Um, I'm, I'm believing that if you are targeting and it's like, you know, I'm like in the laser, if you target your feeding vessel, well, it only needs sometimes 0 0.5, 0 0.7 milliliters. So it's away. And I do not need 20 or whatever milliliters to have high pressure, you know, that's my approach. So a more, let's say I'm a trained surgeon. So a more surgical approach than a, you know, 20 milliliters overwhelming, uh, whatever uh, approach. Okay, thank you for your answer. So I, there are many other questions, but we have to, because we are <laughs> already out of time. So sorry, we have to close and uh, we have to finish. So thank you, Dr. Verizer. Thank you, Dr. Knobloch. Uh, it was really, really two very excellent presentations, clear and uh, very uh, impressive. And uh, for all the audience who uh, also appreciated this moment, I would like to mention this uh, webinar will be also available on our website if you want to watch it again. So thank you again and uh, have a nice evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.